Uh, well, we don't know exactly where it was found at all because it was found by a metal detectorist and uh, he, he decided not to reveal the location um, and there's not really much we can do about that. We know it was found near Didcot, but we don't think it was found actually in Didcot itself. And that was in 2006. So after he'd found it, he reported it to the authorities. He sold it to a private collector who was then going to export it to America last year. And at that point, um, Jody Joy from the British Museum stepped in and had an export bar placed on the mirror and it was offered for sale. And we raised the money and we bought it. So it's very exciting. So the first thing we did when it was in our hands was we took it to Didcot and we put it on display for the day in Didcot so the local people could see it. So that was its very first public outing. It's been on display since then as well in the Oxfordshire Museum in Woodstock. And we started doing some research on it. We got a grant from the HEIF uh, to pay for some research and we're, we've taken a sample, a couple of samples which are being analysed by Peter. Much of the past 40 years I've been researching the applications of metallurgy, particularly physical metallurgy, in archaeology. Everything that has happened to that metal since the bronze left the crucible leaves traces that you can uh, identify with various sorts of microscopy and interpret, plus uh, you can do a compositional analysis which can help you understand where the component parts of the alloy came from and also help you interpret the structure so you know how it was cast, how it was forged. You can find out, look at the surface, find out how it was finished. Uh, you can look at the corrosion and see what happened to it in the ground. And you can also see what the conservators and restorers have done to it since it came out of the ground. Well, we thought about this long and hard and we consulted with a lot of people as there are non-destructive ways of analysis that you can use on metals. But ultimately, if you don't take a sample, the only thing you can analyse is the surface of the metal. Now, if it's a new thing, that's fine because it's a new surface. But with something which is 2000 years old, there's corrosion on the surface. And so what you analyse is the corrosion on the surface unless you polish it and, and in actual fact polishing it would probably do more damage than taking a sample. And the samples are so small um, that it's quite difficult to notice that they've been taken at all I think. And it just gives us more information. What we can tell from a sample is, is more than just the composition of the metal but also the things about the manufacturing process which wouldn't be revealed by, by non-destructive analysis. So you can write a biography for it and if you uh, have enough similar objects, you can pull the biographies and make a bigger story. What metal meant to that society in terms of um, economics, practical functions, uh, aesthetics, all sorts of things, the place of metal in that society. Another way of looking at it is you're um, looking to answer various questions like what is it made of, how is it made, where was it made, and what I think is particularly interesting, which is why was it made like that? We don't know an awful lot about uh, exactly where uh, the mirrors fit in Iron Age iron production. People have focused on the patterns and the decoration, but very few have been analysed. I've done a few, the British Museum have done a few. and my mind is absolutely buzzing with ideas about mirrors. Um, ideas of communicating with the dead. Many mirrors were found in burials uh, uh, face with the, the reflective side towards people's faces. So that must be significant, I think. I think mirrors were probably, in the Iron Age, they were probably um, high status objects that may belong to the nobility. And they're, one has to remember that they are a bit like coins, they're two-sided and that the magic of seeing reflections was, in a sense, encapsulated by the magical art on the, on the rear of the mirror. So I think the two sides really, really spoke to each other and gave that it, their kind of frisson of, of, of magic, as it were. It was just a superb piece. 
and it's so it's so whole, it's so perfect, um, and for that to come up just as a kind of chance find, as it were, it, it immediately begins to make you think of all sorts of stories associated with it. it it's a very evocative artifact. It's so different from a sort of pot or an iron knife or something. It has, it seems to have stories and mythologies, you know, circling around it from the moment you see it. I think that some of the stories relating to mirrors as kind of magical objects stem from the simple fact that until people's ability in the past to create polished surfaces, the only way you could see yourself was in a piece of stagnant water. So I think the fact that you could actually look at yourself um, made people think about doppelgangers and doubles. And, and of course, you don't only see yourself, but you see what's behind you. All sorts of things grew up from that, including stories about, well, is it possible that if I look in a mirror, I might see something different and I might see the past or I might see the future? And of course, if you go into the realms of fantasy literature and Dracula and so on, the whole point about Dracula is that being a vampire, when he, look, when he, when he faces a mirror, there's no reflection. So, of course, you know, I, I think m mirrors, you get the feeling that they are slightly edgy, slightly dangerous, and that you're never really quite sure what you're going to see. And the really exciting thing is I think that we're getting to compare it to the Pegston mirror, which was found in Bedfordshire now as well, because the, the two are so similar, the designs are so similar. You can't conceive that they're not related in some sort of way. So with the scientific analysis, we hope we're going to be able to show there's something more than just the design connecting the two mirrors. Well, the mirror is now on permanent display at the Oxfordshire Museum in Woodstock, which is really exciting. I'm really glad to see it there every time I go. I think it's going to, going to have little adventures away. It'll, it'll go on display um, in Bedfordshire at some point in return for their loan of the Pegston Mirror, I'm sure. And it'll, it'll go to, to London. Um, it's going to be displayed in London at some point. But its, it's long-term home is now on display in the Oxfordshire Museum, which is where it should be.